Kesty. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, it's a real honor to be here with you. Um, the title is Bufo Alvarius and Golden Ratio Resonance, The Key to Transformative Experience. Now, I've got a lot of slides. I'm going to go quickly. Uh, I'm going to flash through. So my thesis is that human beings are hardwired for transformation through golden ratio resonance. David Bohm stated the essential feature of quantum interconnectedness is that the entire universe is enfolded into each and every part, not just us, all of nature. All of nature is alive and aware. Bufo Alvarius triggers non-local resonance, which is now established to occur at the golden ratio to the fifth power. And Stanislav Grof said, 5-MeO-DMT is the fastest way to the absolute. That's from when the impossible happens. <clears throat> so our bodies are actually have the golden ratio symmetries throughout. The navel cuts us at the golden cut. You can see here from this image that the phalanges of the fingers are in golden ratio, but this runs throughout the body and throughout all of nature, the solar system, but we'll see that as we go. Some of the images are going to be from uh, my artists in Peru, from Usko Iyer, who are the students of Pablo Amaringo. I've been collecting their paintings, so I, I grabbed a few that I'll use as kind of introductory material. This one is, uh, the ones you're gonna see are actually from uh, uh, Alfredo Zagacita. So a little bit of background. I'm, I'm gonna make this a little bit personal. So when I was born, I was aware and this is, there is perinatal experiences, near-birth experiences. We all know about near-death experiences. But I was aware, actually floating up above, watching them bring me uh, from the car into the house. And, uh, but I had full awareness, uh, total awareness at the time. And then I blacked out at the doorway as they entered in. And uh, later an experience with my tonsils out where they gave me ether, significant because of the same sinking, blacking out feeling occurred. And we'll see the significance as we go. So I had a, a prevision really of what my object was in this life. And I knew it had to do with beauty and I knew it had to do with numbers and I knew it had to do with Plato in fact. And the first thing I started resonating, resonating with were horses, their beauty, their magnificence. I started to notice the number patterns in nature, particularly pentagonal relationships and then the numbers of the petals on flowers, which turn out to be Fibonacci almost always, sometimes Lucas, here 13 with this brown-eyed Susan. I also had a brother who was extremely powerful, the strongest man in the world at age 18 with his arms. But what I want you to notice is the eyes. The eyes, as Plato says, they exude energy, power. And I learned of focus, intention, and will. And certainly with our experiences with the plant and animal master teachers, intention is extremely important. He was Mr. Minnesota. He had a big impact on me. So as a teenager, I decided to master the physical realm and became one of the top three teenage bodybuilders. And then I won Mr. Apollo, etc. That'll have significance later. So Plato, Plato and mathematics. Uh, so I met Douglas Baker, one of the greatest esotericists in the world, and I learned ancient wisdom from him. And he turned me on to H.P. Blavatsky, who wrote The Secret Doctrine. She said that Plato is the world's interpreter, and the ideas of both Pythagoras and Plato are identical with ours. And I took her seriously. And the Mahatmas, these great souls, these people who have entered into samadhi and are extremely brilliant, they say the following, we recognize but one law in the universe, the law of harmony, of perfect equilibrium. And that's from the Mahatma's uh, letters to A.P. Sinan. So in 75, I graduated from the University of Minnesota and I had been working very hard on Plato's occult doctrine, uh, platonic aesthetics, and everything is alchemical. All of the physics, everything in the universe is alchemical transformation and we need to realize that. It's not just some old chemistry. 
Plato and the Timaeus could not openly reveal the secret of the golden section. It was revealed in the mystery schools, but it was forbidden by what's called the Sodalian Oath. But he did say two things cannot be rightly put together without a third. There's got to be a bond. Proportion is the fairest bond, analogos. And uh, logos, by the way, is ratio. Yes, it's word, verbum, but it is ratio. And you start with the first cut, the first ratio, as we're going to see. So Plato then hints in the Republic, take a line and cut it unevenly. If you cut it evenly, you don't have any oomph. You don't have the drive. It's got to be asymmetric. If you cut it in the middle, the whole line would be as if it's two, and then one half would be as one. So two to one is not the same as the ratio between the parts, which would be one to one. However, if you golden cut it, immediately you have proportion because you have the whole is to the longer in the same ratio as the longer is to the shorter. So you take the line, you assume it's one, you golden cut it, We'll use that symbol there. I'm using one over phi. I also call that phi. That's going to be with the lesser later on as we go. 0.6180339 all the way to infinity. The smaller portion is going to be phi squared. 0.3819, roughly 0.382. If it's hard to think about this, think about this as two thirds. One third is an approximation. However, if you ask what is the ratio now, it's going to be big phi 1.618, etc., to 1, as 1 is to 0.618. This turns out to be the greater and the lesser with unity in between. That's the foundation of Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. All trinities are founded in this ratio and proportion. Now, nature is pretty obvious but we don't pay attention. And most flowers are five petaled. Actually, flowers in general are Fibonacci in number, and we'll see that in a second. So anytime you have a pentagram, if you take that whole line and you measure from here to here, that whole is to that in the golden ratio. That longer segment is to the shorter segment, golden ratio. That shorter segment is the little baby segment there, golden ratio. And the universe fractalizes like this. It's holographic. That's why when we see David Bohm, we'll see the whole universe is enfolded into each part. So Plato then, you take the whole, basically I should tell you very quickly, I put my compass point uh, here, pencil lead there, arc down, cut the line there. You have the secret of the divided line in the Republic, which has always been a big mystery. So the whole is to the, let me back up, if I can, maybe I can. The, the idea is the whole is to the upper length, which is the intelligible, as it is to the lower, the sensible realm. Here we go as the world of forms for Plato, Plato are to the mathematicals, as ordinary objects in here are to the shadows on the wall. The thing about enlightenment is that when you move into the stages of illumination, you bring back down into the cave the music, the artwork, you beautify nature. So the great mystery was always, what is the greater and the lesser of what they call the indefinite dyad? That was the big mystery, because it could not be revealed. We now know exactly what it is. The greater is big phi, 1.618. Now these numbers are irrational, they go to infinity. The lesser is little phi, 1 over phi, 0.618. Now, if you multiply these two together, you go to unity. If you subtract them, you come to unity. When you get to the summit of Plato's cave and he talks about beauty and truth and the good, oneness, that's what's going on. So ultimately you're moving into illumination when you collapse and go into an ego death and you go into union in samadhi. Philotaxis and Fibonacci numbers. So most phylotaxis is spiral like this. Most things in nature are pushing out and spinning at the same time. That's why you get all the spirals. Phylo is leaf, taxis is arrangement. In a wonderful book, Symmetry in Plants, Jean and Barabe say the golden section is at the heart of the whole thing. And it's in the mystery of the daisies and the sunflowers. The 
presence of particular numbers, Fibonacci numbers, which we'll talk more about, angle of 137 and a half degrees, which I'll explain, the golden number, they used to use tau instead of phi, tau for toma, uncuttable, that's why atom, or, or cuttable, the cut, atom, atome, is uh, supposedly the atom. And it, these demand an explanation, the logarithmic spirals, they've been a spur to human intellect, and it's in phylotaxis, it's symmetry in plants, is most striking and puzzling. So they're the th very things we need to figure out. Up here you see a little bit of the Fibonacci expression through the leaves, but what I'm more concerned about here is there are only three basic ways phylotaxis works. Like corn, uh, it's distichous. It goes at 100 degrees out to, out to the sides like this. I guess I gotta keep this up here. The world looks like a cross. You look down from above, but the majority of plants are spiral, and we'll see there's a 137 and a half degree angle. If you golden cut a circle, you'll get 222 and a half degrees, 137 and a half, and what's so interesting is that uh, four out of five of all plants have spiral phyllotaxis, maximum moisture, maximum exposure to the sun, spirals the water down to the leaves. The leaves are not covering the ones below. So it's the most efficient, functional, and the other secret here is what is the most scientifically functional is also the most beautiful. So what's happening here with Fibonacci numbers, here you, oops, you see them down below, you begin with zero and one, and each new number is the sum of the previous two. So zero plus one is one, one plus one, two, one plus two, three, five, eight, 13, 21, 34, et cetera, on to infinity. But if you make ratios out of adjacent numbers, take three is to two, you immediately get 1.5, Five is to three, one point six six six. Fernando had the Ark of the Covenant, which, by the way, is an approximation to a golden uh, cu um, um, rectangle, because two and a half cubits by one and a half cubits is the ratio you have in that Ark. Most, if not all, sacred temples, pyramids, cathedrals, mosques, etc., uh, are, are built where people have knowledge of this. They're based upon this. But what I want you to know is, is as you go on, um, you'll find that the 8 is to 5 is 1.6, a little bit less. And so you alternate up and down. And so all the way, it's coming to infinity. Things are being pulled by the golden ratio throughout nature. So you see with the pine cone, the sunflower, pineapple, Romanesco, good example, simply a uh, pine cone. Pick it up, turn it over. Here you've got 13 spirals. They're all counted here. Uh, I'm not gonna take the time to count them, but if you go the opposite direction, you'll find exactly eight, or you'll have eight and five, or five and three. Sometimes there'll be Lucas. If you look at the Romanesco, you see the fractal aspect as well. If you took a little part of this and blew it up, you'd see that it mimics the whole. That's what's happening. The whole universe is enfolded into each and every part, whether you're looking at a solar system, the quark, a cell, etc. So really a key for meditation and going into uh, areas where you have synesthesia and the third eye opens, here's the key right up here. Phi is to one as it is to phi, and here's your Fibonacci's. Here's one that is not that well known, but is even more fantastic because it's closer to the summit, the divine. These are powers, they're not really numbers. We can translate them as numbers, but they're the powers that give rise to everything in nature and us. So rainforest epiphany. So in the rainforest, there's a resonance that can occur with master plant and animal teachers. And you see that with the music depicted up above in this uh, painting by one of the Pablo students. So here we're entering into the rainforest. Here I am in my tambo in isolation, river down below, working with several different uh, healing types of plants, but then also ayahuasca five times in a row. I've been there eight times up in the mountains doing it down in the rainforest. But uh, one, well, one of the first things that I noticed is the whole rainforest is a single living being. But then 
It was the Jaguar. <clears throat> Sometimes these experiences, you know, they can be extremely painful. And the Jaguar is the top of the food chain, has the consciousness of all of the animals and what we've done to them. But look at every single culture, the Egyptians, the shamans in Africa, Narashima, the fourth incarnation of Vishnu, Dionysus and the Dionysian mysteries rides on the back of a leopard. Yeah, the Huichol Indians, when they come out of their peyote experiences, will do the sacred geometry with the jaguar heads. One of my cats, uh, Maya, thought that she was a big cat as well. But the big cats, big time. So what happened is the shamans knew that I was resonating with the big cats. They got a hold of one of my pictures and they took the face and I thought they were going to do the body, but they did the face. And so that's actually Alfredo Zagasita who did that. Okay, so my primary intention in my shamanic endeavors was to was centered on a deeper understanding of the role of the golden section throughout nature and cosm and the cosmos. That's that was my purpose in life basically. And what we found was that there was a fundamental scale independent modular a hammer like Thor's hammer which is big phi which transforms consciousness and we resonate to this but all of nature does but we should be smart enough to employ it that's the difference um, in one particular instance with the ayahuasca I had this super transformative experience I'd already studied the golden section over and over but I was showing how it works in nature I remained fully conscious for 19 days straight reconnecting with the eternal now. Now, this was my first exposure to 5-MeO-DMT. Not big doses, small doses. Actually, it was 23 days. I blacked out for a couple of days for about an hour. But 19 days straight, and what I would do is I reconnect with the eternal now, with the source, daily. And I was energized. There was no tiredness whatsoever. And then in seven months, I had written the golden section, Nature's Greatest Secret, won first place at the New York Book Show for design. It was, is now in, was in nine languages. This is the 10th. Now it's in Spanish in the 11th in a compilation called Dizinia with five other golden section books. In addition, I worked with Alexei Stakov, this genius, with the mathematics of harmony, and then also the golden section in the non-Euclidean geometries. This is the book in Greek. It's Russian, it's Chinese, etc. We don't have to go through that. Here I am with Pablo Amaringo in 2000, uh, purchasing my first painting, and then I've purchased 10 originals, and then I've got about 250 of his students, and then we did the big exhibit, Mysteries of the Amazon, visionary artwork of Pablo Amaringo and his students. And this is by, that was by his students, this is as well, and that was at the Appleton Museum in Florida. Many of these people I've worked with in ceremonies, including uh, Tito La Rosa and Luis Eduardo Luna, who helped start Usco IR School. This painting is a huge painting by, that one is probably by uh, Alfredo as well. Okay, consciousness and microtubules. So Stuart Hameroff and Sir Roger Penrose are brilliant, the anesthesiologist and the genius mathematician physicist. And it's Penrose and Hameroff in 2011 who first provocatively suggested that consciousness emerges. Now, I think consciousness is there from the beginning, and it's in the numbers. But when they say emerges, it's bringing it out through this resonance, and it's quantum mechanical. The moment you have quantum mechanics involved, you realize you have superposition. You can be in two places at once. In so-called near-death experiences, when people, in fact, do die, they're clinically dead, they come out of the body, their consciousness is out of the body, um, so there's a superposition, but when they're resuscitated or brought back to life, uh, the consciousness and the memory of all of that is there. And it's interesting, these microtubules, these little quantum computers that are in the cells 
But not just the neurons, the cells of the body, they're in the mammals, they're in the plants. Everything is resonating together with this. And there's 13 filaments, eight spiraling in one direction, five the other direction, and at the tips of them are clathrins, which are truncated icosahedra, uh, Buckminster fullerenes. And there's golden ratios galore. And then the DNA, if you take a, a slice of DNA, take a cross section, it's a decagon. It's two pentagons. Anytime you have a decagon with pentagons, you have pentagrams, you have golden ratios. It's a, a resonating golden number system. And uh, so it's, it's, struct it's the structure, but then it's also we're going to see the way things organize. Um, and we get the golden ratio resonance. These are authors uh, from Petakov from Russia, uh, and he was actually from the U.S., and they're participating in my next book, uh, Divine Proportion, The Mathematical Perfection of the Universe. So here in Shadows of the Mind, Penrose writes about these magical microtubules with their 13 filaments and eight by five phyllotaxis. Penrose says, why do Fibonacci numbers arise in microtubule structure? Because of resonance, because it's resonance that's at work in everything in nature. And then we turn to the clathrins and notice here you have a pentagon surrounded by five hexagons. Anytime you have a hexagon, closest packing of space. Anytime you have a pentagon with pentagrams, you have life and consciousness especially unfolded. And the interesting structure of these clathrins is if you take an edge, any edge, and if that's one, and you go across to the opposite side, it's a multiple of exactly three big phi golden ratios. Irrational number, and it's incredible, and that's what this resonance is doing. And these are located at the synaptic cleft. The microtubules are used in cell division, and these are the little clathrins here. The shamans, I know for a fact, they see these as serpents, and these are the jewels in the mouth that they're seeing in these serpents, and here's where transformation of consciousness is going on in the brain. So recently, I just came back from Switzerland, and here I am with, Pen, with uh, Hameroff, and w two of the conclusions in his presentation were that microtube uh, anesthetics prevent consciousness by dampening quantum vibrations in microtubules. Now, when I blacked out um, early on in my near-birth experience, and then later had the ether, the sinking feeling and the blacking out, it reminded me of what happened right after birth. So there's something about the process of stilling the vibrations of the microtubules and also microtubule oscillations. I brought this up last year, and nobody really seemed to, to pay attention, is the likely source of EEG rhythms including gamma synchrony, and it's the best neural correlate of consciousness. And Hameroff has been working at this for years. This was the Science of Consciousness Conference in Interlochen. So then resonance. So Sheldrake is on the right track with his morphogenetic fields and morphic resonance. Actually, there's one be better than that, is Brian Goodwin in How the Leopard Changed Its Spots, where he recognizes the, all the golden proportions and the other resonances. Um, now, Blavatsky, oops, in the secret doctrine said atoms are called vibrations in occultism. We now know that the brain waves of musicians fall into synchronization. Uh, a former dancer told me about how female dancers upset her, their instructor because they'd all suddenly go absent uh, during rehearsal. They were going into their uh, menstrual cycles together in a kind of synchrony. Um, the absence of synchronous, the, the, we observe synchronous attunements in the flight of birds, uh, in the school of fish, swarms of bees, and then near, near absolute zero, we get superconductivity, superfluidity, where everything goes into lockstep coherence. Siddhartha Gautama sitting under the bow tree goes into quantum coherence, potentially in samadhi with the entire universe. Certainly the galaxy, if not, well, certainly solar system, earth, etc., but all the way up, potentially up to the universe itself. Um, okay. 
And again, the brain waves of even uh, guitars playing a jazz tune will go into synchrony. I'm sorry, it's difficult to take shots of this because I've got to move really fast. So uh, the Dutchman Christian Huygens back in 1665 started to try to explain the mu mutual phase locking of two oscillations because he had observed that two pendulums, t pendulum clocks hanging on a wall, they'll tend to go into a synchronous rhythmic swing together. He called it a kind of sympathy. They go on rapport. Uh, this is now known that whenever two or more oscillators in the same field are pulsing at nearly the same time, they tend to lock in, they entrain, they attune, so that they're pulsing at exactly the same time. So here's a little quickie on the synchronization of 32 metronomes that go into synchrony. If I have a, my favorite instrument would be a charango. Uh, charango or guitar. So let's say I strum it, have a... This is the bottom of, well, my point was the guitar or charango in the corner will resonate and will pick up the sound and go into resonance. You've seen the cymatic images, uh, but here is the first images ever recorded, photographs of holograms of a tin can resonating at different frequencies. So you see how sound is transformed into form or shape. That's one of the most beautiful things with the brow center when you begin to see sound in synesthesia, when the senses begin to cross over. So physics and cosmology. So the ubiquity, the presence of the golden ratio is all throughout nature. The Nobel Prizes are now falling into the hands who have figured this out. So under the underlying mathematics uh, of harmony in nature, uh, that's Alexei Stakov. I helped him with that book. Um, it appears that there are certain ratios root five, root two, root three, and the golden ratio. We find them in the Platonic and Archimedean solids, which are kind of are behind all of nature. Um, and then we find the Fibonacci numbers approximating the golden ratio. And then El Nashi found that the chaos border, if you move from order into chaos or vice versa, you go through a window of the golden ratio. The fine structure, constant, quark masses, they're all golden ratios in El Nashi, um, uh, let's see, found that even the quarks themselves um, are golden ratios, but then in 2010, they discovered at the heart of quantum mechanics the golden ratio. So here's what we know about the universe. I'm going to have to step forward here a little bit. The universe is a golden mean Turing type. It's a supercomputer. I'm not, we're not saying it's only that, but it is that. Um, Hardy's quantum entanglement probability is the lesser golden ratio to the fifth power. We can actually calculate it. And this has been demonstrated to be true. It's roughly 9% or about 1 11th of the time, which is remarkably exactly twice as large as the light energy density of the universe. That's why we say we only have 4.5% uh, light energy, the rest... Uh, is, is dark energy and dark matter. You can do the calculations for that as well. I'll show you, I have a paper that's sitting out there that uh, this is taken from, it's free. Uh, and then quark masses, all elementary particles, coupling constants are computable using the golden mean and its powers. And all of this has been confirmed theoretically via some 24 different methods. El Nashi and the paper's out in the lobby. Uh, you'll go to uh, Pete Pietro's table there and it's there for free. All quarks are functions of the golden ratio, so anytime you see these phi symbols, here's your quarks. Also, we've done some YouTube videos, El Nashi and I, Universe as a Golden Supercomputer, and then there's about 25 um, segments in three series, El Nashi and Olson in conversation, and if you want something that's really closely related to this, especially series three, part eight, uh, I have a little, uh, on the poster that's in the hallway, if you have the app, you can actually get it uh, with the app, you can photograph it. Okay, so, 
John Martineau, who is the editor of my golden section book, uh, found that if you view Venus from the Earth over an eight-year period and connect all the dots, you get a five-pointed rosette in the center. And on Venus, that's 13 years. 13 is to eight, as eight is to five, you see in the Fibonacci. So as above, as Hermes said, so below, but you need the geometric golden mean to tie it all together. That was the big secret that could not be revealed that the, to the uninitiate of the mysteries. Then we have the Trappist-1 solar system, and the orbits of the planets are in eight, five, three, two, musical fourth, and one. They're Fibonacci in order. Three of the planets are in the Goldilocks zone. This is where they're looking for life. Now, life is everywhere. Everything is alive. But life in kind of the way we understand it uh, on the macro scale. So non-locality. Uh, quantum coherent states of consciousness uh, where we go into lockstep resonance into broader and broader fields of awareness are inherent and cosmic consciousness is a birthright, and the whole universe is present within us. It's as if we are tuning forks, waiting to go into resonance with the divine source. And as I heard earlier this morning, Mario talking, you know, really that 5-MeO-DMT in the Bufu is a sacrament. <clears throat> So here was my professor at Birkbeck at University of London saying the essential features of quantum interconnectedness are that the whole universe is enfolded in everything and each thing is enfolded back into the universe. That was in his, the undivided uh, universe, our undivided wholeness. Scientific American, are you a hologram? Uh, science suggests this is an old one. Now they say this is the reality of it. It's also fractal. Again, the universe is fractal through the golden fractalization that has occurred. Edgar Mitchell went into Samadhi on the way back from the moon after conducting successful telepathy experiments. Telepathy, clairvoyance, this is all resonance, even the precognition and psychokinesis. And he says, and he also maintained that it's the microtubules and clathrins, the quantum computers are at work. And he said, in the way of the explorer, religious and mystical experience and all psychic effects are the result of individuals bringing non-local information to the level of conscious awareness. Sacred geometry, I'm gonna go quickly on this. So I take sacred geometry to be the fractalized unfoldment of the many out of the one. That was the greatest philosophical question. How does the one become many? But we're also interested here in the resonant reconnection of each of those many, you and I, back to the one. And there's all this resonance that occurs, for example, an icosahedron here, uh, if one of the five platonic solids, if you take an edge and that's one, you go to the other side, it's exactly big phi, the golden ratio. We saw the truncated icosahedron already with the three golden ratios. For time's purpose, I think I'm gonna keep going, but when you nest the solids, you'll find golden ratios occurring everywhere. So the, the Great Pyramid is really a monument to the golden ratio. That's what it is in the end. All the sacred geometry that's in there is, is incredible. That's what it looks like, by the way, from the top. It's kind of steep in there. Um, and here is the mathematics. The height of the golden uh, of the pyramid with its capstone is the square root of big phi, the golden ratio. Unity or one from the center to the outside or half of a length of the side. And then the apothem is 1.618033. That is a very sacred structure, and that's why it is such a phenomenal initiation temple. So Badawi studied over 50 different uh, temples and found that they, in Egypt, and found that they were Fibonacci in, in nature. Here I wanted you to focus on 21 and 34. By the way, a full twist of DNA is 34 angstroms in width, 21 angstroms in, I'm sorry, 34 in length, 21 angstroms in width. Uh, Schwaller de Lubitsch spent 15 years in the Temple of Man in Luxor, and he concluded the golden section is not a product of someone's mathematical imagination, but the natural principle of the laws of equilibrium. 
spider consciousness. You may have seen this before, so I'll run through fairly quickly. So you got to be careful what you put in your system, obviously. Amphetamines. Mickey Finn knocks them out. Chloral hydrate. Interesting at the center, you get a hexagon. Remember that closest pack in the space. And that's what the shaman see in the mouth of the serpent, the microtubules. Benzedrine. Oh, you're not going to like this next one. Caffeine. Entheogen. Carl Ruck came up with that name instead of uh, hallucinogens. N is within, Theo the divine, Gen, Genesis, bringing out the divine that's already present within you. Here's a normal web, entheogen. This was back in 1970s in Time Life books. The scientists who did this said that the spider is induced into an intense concentration, of course, how do they know, but uh, it actually improves on nature's natural web. Transformation of consciousness. Got to step out a sec here. Um, in India, the initiated received the soma, a sacred drink which helped to liberate one's soul from the body. And in the Eleusinian mysteries, they take the kaikian and go into epopteia, where they would see. Uh, the, um, in those mysteries, you had a revelation, a reception into the secrets, a divine clairvoyance, revelation by no human agent, the receiving of the sacred drink, the soma. This is all in Blavatsky's work. This is a big mystery and hidden from the eyes of most is that these Mahatmas were probably participating in the master plant and animal teachers. I put a little note here because of the excellent Do you have another one of these for me by chance? Well, let me go to this one right now. So in these mysteries, all the rules of proportion are those taught anciently um, <clears throat> at, at these initiations. This is Blavatsky talking now. And one should acquaint oneself with this divine art <clears throat> and understand the deep esoteric significance hidden in every rule and law of proportion. That's her italic, so she's hinting. And this was what was not to be revealed, and that's why Plato had to be very careful. I did want to make mention of Julian Palmer's excellent paper in terms of what Soma might in fact be, which was done yesterday. So in the uh, Odinic Mysteries, this is Thor's hammer, Mjolnir. It is a mushroom that is hanging. This is Amanita muscaria. And so Ralph Metzner was well aware of this, one of, another one of my good friend teachers. And uh, here you see it upright. Here's the, and the dots you see are the eyes, the white, and here's Thor. And so when you go into the resonance with these uh, sacred uh, plant and animal teachers now, you're getting hammered. And uh, so look at the structure of Amanita muscaria with the ibotenic acid and then the muscimol, and then we've got to keep going. And here's uh, Odin, who's been hammered with the uh, soma and uh, discovers the runes, the mathematical patterns in nature after nine days of ascetic experience. Uh, Halvard Harlow in Norway has figured out that the Fibonacci and Lucas numbers are all throughout there. So in the beginning was the logos, the ratio. These are all sacred plant teachers. And uh, here I am uh, when I was studying with uh, Houston Smith, Ram Dass, uh, Plato and the divine proportion ascent to the first principles. Of course, he was tuned in, cleansing the doors of perception, the religious significance of, of entheogenic plants, and got it. And so here we see serotonin, dimethyltryptamine, and 5-MeO-DMT. And Harry Croto winning the Nobel Prize for the discovery of carbon-60 with a Buckminster fullerene. And then you look at this single fern in the rainforest, and you see its structure. And then you go here, and you go into samadhi, cosmic consciousness. And remember um, that uh, Groff said, 5-MeO-DMT is the fastest way to the absolute. 
to help save the bufo toad, we need to remember he went into the samadhi state with synthetic 5-MeO-DMT. If we start as a group expressing this a little bit more, we might help save the toad, which is a, a, a great sacramental substance. Again, there's omniscience, all-knowing omnipotence, all-power omnipresence, spread throughout the whole thing, the light, and then going into ecstasy or ecstasis. Got two more slides. And so here's the well of remembrance. Plato said, uh, learning is memory. Um, and again, the structure. And so homo luminosity is our goal. The human being in the enlightened state, and we're hardwired for transformation with the golden resonance. We're like stem cells with a purpose, but the purpose is beyond our soul's purpose. It's the purpose of the source. So thank you very, very much. <laughs>